going on guys? My name is Noah and this is Broken Arrow Bison. So we've got a little bit of a different video for you guys today. There's a gentleman by the name of Ryan Murphy. He runs a YouTube channel called Freedom Foods Farm and he has gotten into raising longhorns. He's done a really good job of explaining of how he raises his longhorns and doing it in a regenerative agricultural way, um, meaning doing mob grazing or intensive grazing, things like that. So check out the conversation that Ryan and I had about our farm, how we got started, and also how he got started too, and how we're really not that far apart um, as far as the way we operate with our farm and the way we handle things. So hope you enjoy it. So, um, the wind's picking up a little bit again now. Um, so tell me a little bit about like your journey. Um, it sounds like we come from very similar backgrounds as far as growing up in the city, uh, wanting to do something a little bit different. Like what brought you to get out of the city and start raising longhorns? Well, it started back, well, what happened really was my aunt got sick and uh, she got cancer and she was 79 years old and I was looking at every way possible, you know, w what caused it. You know, I, I was the one to take her to all the chemo appointments. I was the one to, you know, take her to all the doctor's appointments and that was really tough. She was, she was actually able to beat it on her 80th birthday, but I went, okay, how can we make sure that this doesn't come back and how it doesn't happen to me or anybody else in my family? And it got me down the whole rabbit hole of real food. And I, was, I came across, uh, I think, Justin Rhodes' videos. And then uh, it led me over to Joel Salatin. And I was up probably, I was up all night watching those videos. Just because, you know, once you get down that rabbit hole, you just continue to go. I'm going, wow. I mean, it actually really started with a video of, uh, you know, how to raise radishes, actually. <laughs> Funny enough. And I was like, okay, you know, that's pretty cool. You can do it in 28 days in your backyard. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna try this. And one video led to another and led to another. And I'm going, meat chickens on pasture? Wow, okay. I've heard about grass-fed beef, but I don't really know the difference between grass-fed and what else they would eat. And then after seeing what, you know, how the animals are treated, after the seeing how, you know, what the animals are put into your, were put into their body, because in reality is, you are what you eat ate and seeing that they're fed a bunch of you know Monsanto raised corn and soybeans both chickens pigs cows sheep ducks geese all the above I went I don't want to do that I don't want to do that and seeing the way that you know Greg Judy Joel Salatin do it and a lot of other people I go I can do that and for me I, I've always been wanting to get my own place. My whole dream a long time ago was to, to go retire to a ranch in Montana. And, you know, why Montana? I don't know. Just because I probably saw it in a movie one time or something like that. That's but I got right. to I've look got in. the same dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, you see the, you know, the picturesque mountains and everything. You, you know, you see the, the wildlife and you just go, wow, that'd be pretty special. But, you know, when you look into Montana more, it gets pretty freaking cold. And for a long time. And, you know, coming from Southern California, that is not something that I was nearly even ready, you know, even prepared for. So when we were looking for a place, we, uh, we kind of, you know, me and my fiance kind of looked at the map of the U.S. and said, we don't want it to get below 10 degrees. Drew a line. We don't want it to, we don't want to deal with hurricanes. Drew a line. We didn't want to have to deal with the desert. Drew another line that left us with East Texas, uh, part of Arkansas, and some of the Southern Oklahoma. And uh, when you see that Texas has no state income taxes, I said, okay, I'm gonna go there. Yeah, it's pretty enticing. <laughs> so we found a place and you know, we got 30 acres here, started it, and we've been here for like, it's about 14 months almost exactly now. And we've been loving every mi minute of it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, I guess leading into that, like why Longhorns? Why not Angus or Buffalo or whatever, you know? What, what led you into Longhorn? 
it's funny enough because I actually looked into the buffalo and the videos that I saw on YouTube and stuff, they kind of scared me and they were a little bit more intimidating than cows. Sure. So I said, okay, and then we also live off of a 70 mile an hour highway that you might be able to hear in the background. So uh, I didn't want, I wanted things that were a little bit easier to keep in and you know, someone that has never had, never even really touched a cow before, never seen a cow. I wanted to start with something pretty easy. And then when it came to Longhorns, it was kind of funny because we got here in March and um, we're trying to get settled. The whole, you know, pandemic starts and the, the lockdown start happening. So we're like kind of scrambling, trying to get set up here, trying to, you know, figure out what this thing is. And then we were like, okay, the grass starts growing up. We get settled for a month. And I know that I don't want to have to mow 30 acres or I don't want to turn it into hayfield. And I just, I want to get the farm going. So right. I go on Craigslist and I see, you know, kind of what's out there and I see, you know, different prices, you know, across the board for Angus, Beefmaster, Limousine, Charlay, all the above. I'm going, okay, so it's kind of standard across the board. And then I saw an ad for Longhorns and for, for heifer calves, the guy was selling them for $200. And I went, wait a second, I'm going to look at this because $200 for a cow. I mean, I, I didn't know the difference really at all, only that the Longhorns have Longhorns. And then I got down another rabbit hole for the past, for the for the next week, and seeing all the benefits of them. I mean, for to for beginners, I wouldn't start with any other cattle, because they're so much more docile. They're so much more. They're they're a lot smarter, because of how they, um, because of how they came to be. You know, they came over on Christopher Columbus's second voyage, and or the the descendants of the Longhorn, and then they got out after you know a few years in captivity and for two three hundred years they were out roaming the plains of texas mexico arizona and, you know new mexico really all the way up they made their way all the way up to canada actually and seeing that they developed on their own out in the wild made me go okay and you see what what they are as far as parasites they're extremely parasite resistant they're the probably the most parasite resistant of any cattle and then you see what their beef turns into, especially grass-fed, grass-finished. It's a lot leaner, it's a lot different. It actually has, per, per, per weight, per, per pound, it has less calories than chicken breast. And it's a lot really? more nutrient dense. So I'm going, this is different. I'm, I'm looking into it more, and I found a few people that actually do it. There's only maybe two or three around the country that actually raise grass-fed, grass-finished longhorns. And you know, a lot of people that pull back on this is oh they're stringy the longhorn beef is tough well going on going and talking to them and seeing what they had to say no it's really not it's how the 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 the, the beef is raised you know a lot of people say grass-fed beef is tough why well you also have to look at how the animals raised and going back to you are what you eat ate and they are what they eat and when you see what they're eating and you see the different forages that they're eating. Grass-fed animals that are turned out to pasture, just openly grazed, yeah, they're gonna be tough. Why? Because think of it like this. Think of um, a romaine piece of lettuce, okay? You know, just the one leaf of romaine lettuce. The very right. top of it is very soft, very supple, and that's the part that you enjoy. The stalk, it's tough. It's, you know, it's not something that, you know, you eat, you know, because you want to. You'd rather go after the, the, the more leafier part. Well, when you look at grass, it's the same thing. You keep you get a grass blade. You look at the top third. It's like that romaine lettuce. It's really soft. It's really supple. Supple. That's where the flavor comes from. That's where the softness comes from. If you let cattle just turn out and you know free range on their own, they're gonna be eating the lowest part, the lowest part of the grass because grass grows on an S curve, and if you don't keep them off that grass, they're gonna be eating the bottom third over and over and over again, which is gonna make their beef tough. And then also, it depends on when you, when you, you process them. You see, when you process grass-fed animals, you have to at least give them 90 days after, you know, the dormancy season breaks in order to season or in order to flavor up. So we will only, we will only process between June and at latest October. Because if you process during the winter time, if they're eating hay, they're on hay, or they're eating, you know, kind of more roughage, they're going to be tougher animals. So putting all that together between the parasite resistancy, the, the, them being as docile as they are, as easy as they are keepers, and kind of how friendly they are when I went and met them, I went, okay, I'm gonna try with these three. 
and then the three got them trained to the electric, got them going. Um, saw, okay, said, you know, three cows on 30 acres doesn't work. So we ended up uh, getting two more. And then uh, from my friend across the way who rents that pasture, we got uh, two Charlotte Angus crosses just to kind of see, okay, what, what is the difference in the beef cows? And one of our cows that we call sheep, and another one that we got a little bit afterwards, her name's Scarlet. They're almost identical in age. And a lot of people say the beef cows grow out a lot faster, which is true. Now, I wanted to see how much faster. These two cows, they're almost identical in age, and their sheep, our Charlotte Angus Cross, is only maybe a few pounds heavier than Scarlet, our same age Longhorn. And really? even if I have to keep the Longhorns on pasture a little bit longer, even maybe three or four months before, you know, they can go to processing, hey, I'm, I'm good with that to, you know, reap all the other benefits that go along with them. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot of people talking about that um, as far as, like, what kind of grass they're eating and what age because a lot of people do push back on that and say, you know, grass-fed animals are tough, they're stringy, like you were saying. But you're right, it really comes down to exactly what they're eating and what types of grasses. Um, exactly. So I think that's a really cool thing that you really focused it focused on that from the get-go. You know, it's, it's you're a grass farmer. When, you, when you, you know, you're trying to grow ruminant animals, you're not, you're not truly a, a farmer, per se. You, you, you're, you're not a rancher, you're not trying to grow beef. If you focus on trying to grow grass, the beef is a byproduct and it'll follow. Right. And then right. another thing with the Longhorns too, is that uh, you, know, you wanna get cattle that are developed for your area. And the Texas Longhorns have been here for hundreds of years and have thrived here on their own. So what's gonna thrive here the best? We're in Texas, East Texas, so you know what? I've said decided we go with Texas Longhorns. And then as far as the Angus, you know, we stayed away from Black Angus for a reason and not because of, you know, the, the birthing weight issues or the, the um, you know, just their kind of craziness issues that, you know, they've been known to have. They're, they're a lot more aggressive. Um, but because of their hides, I mean, in Texas, it gets pretty hot. And when you go take the, the temperature the, of the, the hide of a Black Angus compared to, you know, Red Angus or Hereford or any other, you know, different color animal, they're going to be 20 degrees hotter, which means that they're going to be more apt to hang around the trees and be in the shade longer. So that's why we stayed away from them. And, you know, I, I did a whole video on that and took a quite a bit of heat. But but if you're in North Dakota, I would say, you know, go get the, the, the darker hided animals because those are going to do better, you know, when it gets negative 70 degrees or what, however cold it gets there. So you got to go where what's developed for your area. Right, right. And that's a good way to look at it as far as you know, your demographic of your area, um, what does best. So, no, that's that's awesome. So, how are you liking it coming from the city, going to the country, uh, living the country life? It's been a little bit of an adjustment, you know. Chipotle is not right around the corner anymore. Sure. <laughs> you know, we you, you have to plan a little bit more. I mean, we, we there, there's only so much of a jump that we wanted to make. Um, we, in the city that we live in or live right outside of we're only five or six minutes away from town so it's not too much of a jump so you know coming from LA County this is different this is uh, very different we're not near the beach anymore but I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying it you know I don't know if you've ever been to California or gotten on an, on the 405 freeway at five o'clock in the afternoon that is miserable that is absolutely miserable <laughs> And here, the biggest traffic jam that we have is if we get stuck behind a tractor. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So it's, it's, I, I've been enjoying it, we love it, and it's just been pretty special. Yeah, Longhorns have always kind of captivated me as far as uh, the beef side of things. Um, I've always said that I thought I would have at least a couple Longhorns. Um, and maybe once we get established with these guys, we'll, uh, we'll do something else with with some longhorns but i think it's a really cool way to to look at it and the way you've approached things um is very commendable 
Well, I mean, you look at it from just one side of it, you know, being being able to adapt to the area, being easier on me, the beginner. And then you also look at it from the business business side of it. You know, if we're able to get, you know, steers for about $250, Guess what? We can go raise those steers up. We're gonna uh, have them processed, and we're gonna sell either the whole halves or quarters, and we're probably gonna even do individual steaks. The the just the cost savings wise, and because long grass fed, grass finished Longhorn is so different, we're we you know the market's there for us to be able to upcharge because it's it's a premium product to even higher than you know grass finished beef. So just from a business wise, it's easier to get into, it's less of a risk, and we can charge more in the end for, in, uh, as the end product. So it just makes a lot more sense for us. Yeah, so like the growth season of Texas, um, what is the typical growth season of Texas with you doing mob grazing or, in, or intensive grazing? How much less are you feeding hay? Okay, that now if you talk to anybody around here, the grow season in Texas is from mid-April to mid-October, which is standard across the country. Okay, but because of what we're doing and moving the cows every day, now we have 22 head because we just had our first calf just a couple days ago. Um, but we carried 13 over the, the entire course of winter and we used our extra hay that we didn't use as kind of leverage to in order to, to go get eight more steers. Um, you know, because we had we had the extra grass and it wasn't going to cost us anything more. So overall, our 13 head that we overwintered, we went through, I believe it was 16 or 18 hay bales, which is unheard of. We only fed hay for 50 days. Why? And I, I, I think that I could have gotten away with maybe, I don't know, I, I want to say about 10 to 20 days of feeding hay because we did have that snow apocalypse that happened and it hit us pretty hard to where, you know, we had two feet of snow on the ground and, you know, it was it was pretty tough during that time, during that week. But as far as hay, I mean, we, we fed the average person around, excuse me, the average person around here feeds hay for 180 days. We did it for 50. I made a mistake of mowing behind the cows in like kind of mid to late October because it was just kind of starting to grow up and I wanted them to get that green growth. And that, I, you know, newbie didn't know that was a mistake. Um, I probably could have, if I didn't do that, I probably would only had to feed hay for about 20 days. And that's a huge, huge, huge cost saving. So just in that 50 day window, we're like 20% of what uh, the average rancher around here feeds. I mean, it just makes so much sense to move them around. And this year, what we're going to be doing is uh, seeding out some fescue seed because we basically had no winter grasses here. We only had one area that produced a little bit of clover for us, but we were just basically going off a stockpile the entire winter. So this next season, I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens. No, that's incredible. Um, I think the whole term like regenerative agriculture, um, turns a lot of people off they they look at some of these things like mob grazing intensive grazing regenerative agriculture and that what encompasses everything and they kind of think well you know it's a bunch of hippies um you know i i grew up in the city myself but uh, my grandparents were out in the country so i you know that was my second home so i resonate with people in the country and i understand that like they they can grow up on um just traditional farming practices throw your cows out in the field don't rotate them um you know plow the ground up and and don't put anything back into the soil other than you know nitrogen and, and whatever you think it needs um by doing the soil tests but i think that some of the disconnect um that i think people have is that like it's it's the the techniques of doing regenerative agriculture and things like that it's not a trend it's not something that's just hey you know it's a fad it's going to come and go it's actually something that's better for the ground um but not only better for the ground but it's actually better for your pocketbook like what you're saying is you're feeding less hay um yes you know you're going out there and moving your cows every day but how long does that take you know t tell me how, how long does that take to actually go out there and move your cows once a day well that's where you have to set yourself up for success okay because 
you know, you want to learn by going and setting in the, the fence post every day. You know, you want to learn, okay, you want to section them off th this much every day. And we have 30 acres here and that kind of, that works out perfectly because we want to have a 30 day rotation, a 60 day rotation, and depending on the, how the winter's going, maybe 120 day, kind of, that, that's kind of variable. Okay. So what I did is I, uh, I try, I did the whole set up the line every day thing and that got old pretty quickly because that took up a lot of time. Um, so what I did is I went and I sectioned off 31 acre paddocks, believe it or not. And they have what I like to call temporary permanent fencing. Okay. And what I have is, uh, I have the, one of them right in here in front of me. You can't see it, but everybody else will. It's a, it's a, a, a snow stake. You know the the stake, the orange stakes that you see in the the ground. You know, up in like, you know, Minnesota, where there's a lot of snow, to where people can see where the driveway is. Sure. Well, I have one of these here, and they're made out of fiberglass. Fiberglass is not conductive. And what I did is, I got a hundred these off of Amazon for like 65 bucks or something like that. I took a drill press and I drilled um, four holes in them. And right now we're only using two holes. I just put four just in case we ever wanted to do sheep or something like that. And uh, I, I uh, put 17 gauge wire just through, uh, uh, through the holes and that's what I'm using as my temporary permanent paddocks. So every day, all I have to do is go lift up the gate that I used, uh, that I made with basically just two T-posts and some poly wire. And to move them every day takes me on average two minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's well worth the cost. Of Exactly, and I, I get where people are coming from because like my neighbors and stuff I'm not trying to convince them to to go and start doing things my way the different way Because you know, they've been in the cattle business for 30 40 50 years in some cases Who am I to go tell them how to do it differently? You know, I'm not I'm not here to try and you know change their minds What I'd like to do is I'd like to one inspire you know other people maybe people from the city or people that just want to get into cattle to do things a little bit differently or two, just show them, you know, show them there's a better way because you know, there's the, you should always be skeptical with everything, but you can't let that, you know, skepticism turn into ignorance. So when they're able to see how much more grass we're growing here, how much less hay we're feeding here, Hey, maybe they come around, maybe they don't. But I think the, the next generation of ranchers of farmers and stuff will be. And when they see, Hey, you know what? We're actually making some money here. That'll change their minds. Right. Right. No, I, you're absolutely right. I, I have a lot of friends who are doing uh, things the traditional way. You know, I've got a lot of farmer friends and stuff, and there's I I don't put them down at all. That that's the way they were raised. Um, that's the way they grew up in the in the area. Um, but just to be able to see that there are some tweaks that you can do, and they're really not hard, um, and you can be able to actually put more money in your pocket be able to regenerate the soil and actually as the generations go past um, the ground actually gets better and not depleted exactly i mean no we've been grazing since march L late april or no late uh late february early march we've been grazing since then it's crazy that's awesome and we we only started uh, the first day that we fed hay was january i believe it was january 17th very cool so i mean it, it, it's 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 just being it, you just go look at it from just that perspective alone and you see how much better the animals do on it i mean it's kind of a no-brainer to me but i get why people need to see it over a you know a longer course of time or let somebody else make the mistakes first but it i think at this point now with all the stuff that greg judy and joel south have been able to do for as long as they've been able to do it i think that now i think people are getting a little bit more open-minded to it yeah, yeah, I know. I definitely have seen it, seen it come into fruition a little bit more lately. So, very cool, very cool. Well, um, like I said, I think we've got a lot in common. We raise two different kinds of animals, um, but we kind of have a, a common end goal when it when it comes to um, try, farming practices and 
and getting away from a faster pace of life and, and to more of a uh, fulfilling one. I had one, I was so. thinking about the conversation we had the other day when we were setting this up and uh, sure. about your, your bison, how to keep them in a little bit better. And I, here's, a, here's something that you might want to give a try. Um, because the, the poly wire that's going to, or the, even if you're using poly braid that for them, they're going to be able to run through that all day long. What I, what I would almost suggest you do is, uh, you've, have you heard of timeless fence post? No, I don't think I have. Okay. Look them up. Uh, Greg Judy's a big proponent of them and I've seen a few of them, uh, around here. And if I had to do it all over again, I'd create our lane with that. Um, what they are, they're, they're, they're PVC vinyl fence posts that they're, they're actually stronger than your regular T-posts that you would get. And they're non-conductive. If you were to section off your pasture, you know, maybe two or three sections, just divide it up into thirds um, with, uh, with that timeless fence post and then 12 gauge high tinsel wire, you could rotate your buffalo or your bison. Sorry, it's not, they're not buffalo, I know that. Uh, you can rotate your bison through it, through those different paddocks and they probably won't jump that because that'll be a lot more charged and it's more of a, a barrier for them so if you if they can learn how to rotate through that they would be more open to um, you know maybe doing the poly wire or if you want to look into what I have set up here with these uh, these 67 cents fence posts and some 17 gauge wire because they'll be more trained to it to where they won't touch it I, that's just one suggestion that I might have to see if uh, to keep your buffalo in a little bit better. Yeah, no, that's that's a good one. Um, I I went ahead and pulled down um, all the poly wire just because um, I don't think it is given a hot enough charge for them. Um, and the single wire, I I tried a, a bunch of different things in the past. I tried um, a single wire. They jumped that. Uh, then I went to two wires, then I went to three wires, four wires, um, and what I think I figured out, I'm like right on the verge of it. There's a there's another guy who uh, I interviewed, Zach Bell, you can check that video out, um, and he, we actually kind of brainstorm on s some of the stuff too because he raises bison too. Um, but I think what it really comes down to is the height needs to be right. Um, there needs to be a mid wire and, and a low wire and they just in, in the pasture size needs to be right too. So we're definitely, uh, definitely like I'm right on the cusps of figuring it out. And I think, uh, once I do, it's going to be awesome, awesome results. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say that my cows don't get out at all. I mean, my cows probably, they, they go, they, they move, I like to say they move themselves to the new paddock probably on, uh, once every two weeks, I'll just go out there and they'll go flip up the, the, the poly wire gate that I have and they'll go move themselves, but it's only to the next paddock cause I have the next few wires set up. So I'm not, not too upset with it. Yeah. They're rearing and ready to go. They want green grass. Yeah. They're, they're, they're just like, okay, you know what? We, we, they, they love that top third of the grass. If they can keep eating that top third and only that top third, it keeps the grass in its growth stage and then it's better for them. And it's just, it, the, the sugars rush up there in the afternoon and they just do overall better on that top third. So I'm not, you know, upset when they go and move themselves, you know, once every two weeks. Right. Right. Yeah. Buffalo are a little, little different when it comes to that. They, um, They'll, they'll jump it and then because they're such herd animals, they have separation, separation anxiety. So they can, once one gets on the other side of the fence, they can start kind of freaking out. Um, so the behavior and how you handle them, uh, you have to approach them a little bit different. But yeah, I, that's awesome. But yeah, I mean, if you can figure that out, I think that'd be a great, you know, you'd be a, definitely be an innovator in the space. And it's something that I, I really looked into doing because, hey, before the Longhorns were here, the Buffalo were the ones, the, the, the kings of the plains. And it'd be, just be cool to, you know, bring that back. And, uh, you know, their, their meat is, I think, really comparable to, to Longhorn because I know it's a little bit leaner than, uh, than your traditional beef cattle. Yeah, there there are some guys who have uh, I have heard some rumors that they are doing it doing it successfully. I haven't found out who they are yet. Um, just kind of friend of friends, um, and I need to do a little bit more research on that. But there are some guys. I mean, Ted Turner, for instance, um, 
there's a video out on him and his ranch manager he he did some testing on it um and he they that's where they kind of just discovered the size of the pasture the shape of the pasture has has to do with it and stuff too so um i know it's i know it is uh doable it's just finding out the right method just like anything else you know you pioneer in the space you just got to figure out the way the best way to do it I hope you guys are enjoying this interview. Go ahead and click the link down below. Check out his channel, Freedom Foods Farm, and we actually continued the interview on his channel. So check out his channel, and I appreciate you guys supporting us. Remember to like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you for joining us on our journey. We will see you next time.